Amen. Well, it feels like it has been uh, quite a while since I've been up here. In reality, uh, it's only been a week. It was a long, crazy week in the McLean household. But Sunday morning always kind of sets as, uh, serves as a reset for at least our family and uh, a reset very uh, welcome this week. Uh, I know a lot of you guys have similar feelings about Sunday morning as well. The, uh, the day of rest, refreshment that you need to go on through the next week coming your way. But I also uh, give thanks to God for the blessing, the privilege, and the honor being able to each Sunday morning preach to you all. As preaching is a tool that the church has utilized since its very foundation. Paul spent time preaching in the city of Corinth and many, uh, pretty much anywhere he went, Paul would, would one mode of communication in which he would use to advance the gospel message uh, was preaching. It's been a very uh, valuable tool for uh, over 2,000 years now. And Paul this morning dedicates a portion of the scripture that we will be reading uh, today to that practice of preaching. If you have your Bibles, you can start to open up to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to take a look at a, a snippet of Paul talking about preaching this morning as we continue our series called Called Together. A few weeks ago, we, uh, we started this series, and we are taking a look at the first six chapters of 1 Corinthians in this series. In verse 2 of chapter 1, Paul says that he wrote this letter to the church in Corinth, and that this church was to be called to be saints together. And so Paul acknowledges right at the very beginning that they had a calling, they had a responsibility that they had to fulfill, and they had to fulfill this together as a church family. And although this letter was not originally written for us today in the 21st century, there is so much information that we can glean and apply to our lives as a lot of the circumstances that the church of Corinth found themselves in is very similar to the world that we live in today, especially here in the States. I I compared the city of Corinth to our nation as a whole. There are a number of similarities. And so though, although we're separated by about 2,000 years in time, really, there are a number of similarities between us and uh, this church family in Corinth and what they were dealing with, their, their external circumstances. And so the Apostle Paul, he went to go visit uh, the city of Corinth first, and he's credited for founding this church in Corinth. He spent around 18 months there. And after he left, he heard a report of how things were going at the church, and this is his response to that uh, report. This is 1 Corinthians. And thus far, we've seen uh, in, in this uh, first chapter, we've seen that the church in Corinth was divided. One issue they were divided on was who they sought as their leader. Paul urges them all to agree. To help unify the church, Paul approaches the situation with thanksgiving. And he puts the the focus primarily on God and Christ Jesus, not on our own power. And then last week we saw Paul talk about the wisdom of God in contrast to the wisdom of the world. And what seemed foolish to the world of what was accomplished on the cross, God orchestrated that into the greatest story of success and victory in conjunction with the resurrection. So that's kind of where we pick up here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 after Paul talking about the wisdom of the world in contrast with with the wisdom of God. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1, And I, Paul, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So in this this opening section of chapter 2, Paul details his perspective of preaching. And Paul went here talking about uh, this method of preaching because of the division that the Corinthian church was experiencing. Two of the issues that divided the church were what kind of preacher should fill the pulpit and what former minister the church was to follow. Paul already said that some followed Paul, some followed Apollo, some followed Peter, and some thought they were the only ones who followed Christ. Well, Paul said uh, in in verse 17 of chapter 1 that he spoke the simple message of the gospel, the simple message of the cross, not with words of eloquent 
wisdom. You see, in our culture, music and movie stars and superb athletes, those are the popular icons. I'm guessing most, if not all of us, are familiar with the names of Taylor Swift and LeBron James and Tom Brady's of the world. Those are the popular icons that, uh, of the society that we live in. In the Greco-Roman world that Paul and the church in Corinth lived in, uh, it was a bit different. It wasn't necessarily uh, the, the, the superb athletes or, or the movie stars, uh, the, the drama uh, people who were the big icons in their worlds. Uh, a, good, a good example or demonstration of that would be what names are you familiar with in this Greco-Roman world? Chances are you're, you're probably familiar with the names of like Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar, some of the uh, leaders of the Roman uh, government, the Roman Empire. But you're also probably familiar with the names of Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, some of these brilliant men who were uh, a few hundred years uh, before the life of Paul. But the same trajectory continued through uh, the life of Paul and, and those around him. It was those who had impressive speech and those who had brilliant minds who were the popular icons in this Greco-Roman world that Paul and the church in Corinth were living in. And so with that being said, some certainly would have expected Paul or wanted Paul to preach in eloquent and sophisticated terms, just like all of the other popular icons of their day. But that was not Paul's objective. Paul was not seeking to woo anyone with lofty speech or wisdom. He simply wanted to speak about Jesus Christ and him being crucified. For verse 2, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so it doesn't take a, a genius to figure out who Jesus is. He is the son of God. He is God's chosen one. It, it, it is a simple truth for all to hear. And Paul wanted to share the simple message with all of his recipients and his letters and, and the people that he was preaching to and the people they would talk to day in and day out. But Paul says that uh, he, he wasn't uh, someone uh, really impressive in speech. He said, verse 4, my speech and my message were not in plausible words and of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. When Paul talks about his lack of eloquence in speech, I, I'm reminded of two people. I, first off, I'm reminded of Moses. So if we remember the story of Moses and uh, this instance of this burning bush where I, I believe an angel representing God talking to Moses, and essentially God is calling Moses to free the Israelites from slavery, a very high calling, a high responsibility that God was placing on the shoulders of Moses. Well, uh, like many of us, when we have a high calling or high responsibility, we, we may try to shudder and flee away from that calling or responsibility on our lives. And that was Moses was doing. He was trying to get away from this calling in his life. And one of the big excuses that he gave uh, to God was that he was slow in speech. God, how, how am I able to free the Israelites from Pharaoh and the Egyptians if I'm slow in speech? Uh, that, that was an excuse that he gave. Ultimately, he submitted to that calling and responsibility that God placed on his soldier uh, on his shoulders, and Moses did phenomenal work. And I also think about my grandfather. Uh, my grandpa was one of my biggest role models and influencers in my life. He was my pastor for all throughout my childhood until he fell asleep in death. And the story uh, goes, I wasn't there, so I, I can't uh, say if it's true or not. But the story goes uh, that my grandpa failed speech class in school and was told that eh, you probably should not be a preacher. Uh, but I am uh, so glad that he remained faithful to that calling of being a pastor. He's probably the person who influenced my desire and decision to be a pastor the most. Uh, as our firstborn's middle name is Ray, named after my grandpa. And so I'm reminded uh, of Moses and Paul in my life, uh, of people who had profound impact in sharing the gospel message, but who had uh, these excuses or who weren't the most eloquent speechers, they, they, they weren't the most impressive rhetoric skills, whatever the case may be. And so the lesson that I draw from Paul, Moses, and my grandfather is that you don't need to be a genius and a perfecter of speech to do great work for God. 
Paul, arguably the most important, most central figure in church history uh, after Jesus. Moses freed the Israelites from Egypt. He, he's viewed as like the guy in the Old Testament. And uh, in my personal experience, uh, my grandfather, big impact. And you can probably think of people in your life who maybe weren't the, 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 the smartest person in the world. They, they weren't the, they didn't perfect uh, this method of speech, but they probably had a profound impact on you and your walk and your uh, faith in God. And so we don't need to be a genius. We don't need to perf be a perfecter of speech to do great work for God. I find oftentimes uh, like they, they'll, uh, and, and this is uh, agreed in polls as well, uh, people will be asked, what stops you from talking to your friends or family about uh, the simple message of God and Jesus and the cross? And consistently, one of the top answers is, I don't know what to say, or I, I don't know enough in that situation. But, but the lesson here is that the message of the cross is simple. The, the, who Jesus is is simple. Who God is is simple. We don't need to be the smartest person in the world. We don't need to be perfectors of speech. If you are willing to talk about the message of the cross, God will do great things through you. So do not use that as an excuse in your life. And then Paul says then in, in verse 5, uh, kind of the purpose of his preaching says, so that, or because your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So this purpose of Paul preaching, uh, going through all this time, energy, and effort, and preaching to all these people is so that the people would put their faith, not in men, but in God. As faith is the ultimate instrument in which we accept God's salvation in our, life, in our life. God freely offers salvation to all. And all we have to do is accept that free gift by our faith in God and Christ Jesus. And so that was Paul's purpose in his preaching. And so we continue in uh, verse 6, uh, kind of uh, continuing along these same lines as these past 20 verses or so. And Paul says in verse 6, Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So right off the bat in verse 6, uh, Paul says, Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Among the mature, Paul is, is feeding these people. And, and this could have been perceived, I imagine, as a slight jab to the academic elite in the world. There's certainly a number of academic elite in the city of Corinth as they perceive themselves as the mature ones in this world. But, but Paul is indicating that it is the, the believers, it is the church who are the mature ones. And so I imagine that that would get under the skin uh, of some of the academic uh, elites in, in the city. But Paul was saying that it's the mature, it's the church in whom they were sharing this wisdom of God with. And the wisdom that Paul imparts believers through preaching and other means is the secret wisdom of God. Most uh, translations read mystery rather than secret in verse 7, uh, the mystery of God or the secret of God. I appreciate that the ESV translates it as a secret, as I don't think Paul is saying that this wisdom of God is some profound mystery that only the likes of Sherlock Holmes can uncover. Uh, that would contradict just uh, what he was saying in these previous five verses. But instead, I think Paul is talking about that this wisdom of God, that this message of the cross and how that is wise compared to the idea of the world is simply secret. It's simply hidden. People simply have not opened their eyes or their ears to the simple message of the wisdom of the cross, the good news of the cross, the good news of God and Christ Jesus. So this message is not some profound mystery. It is simply a message that people have either yet to hear or refuse to open their eyes, their minds, their hearts, and their ears to this message. But this wisdom that Paul imparts to this church through, through letters, through uh, preaching, through, through speaking, whatever the case may be, it is a secret wisdom because people uh, are not tuning in to this simple message being uh, presented. And Paul makes the, the argument uh, that, that it is secret, that it is hidden, uh, for the very fact that Jesus was crucified by the rulers of their world. 
the rulers presumably would have been some of the wise of their age. If they did understand God's secret hidden wisdom, certainly they would not have had Jesus crucified, God's chosen Messiah, the Christ, but they were lacking in the wisdom of God, the wisdom that Paul freely shared to the, to the mature or to the church. And we can find that to be true in our day and age as well. The, the wisdom of God remains hidden from many people. And just like Paul shared this simple message of Christ and the crucifixion, we have that responsibility, that calling to share that simple message of Christ and the cross and the story doesn't end there either with the resurrection and our plan of future resurrection as well in God's coming kingdom. We have that responsibility. So Paul continues in verse 9. He says, But as it is written, what no eye has seen nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. And so the rulers and most of the people during Paul's life, they didn't understand God's wisdom. They didn't understand the idea in which God would have his son crucified. They, they, they failed to understand that. But Paul says that God is giving them a tool to uncover this wisdom and this perspective of God. And that tool is the spirit, the spirit of God, uh, often uh, called the Holy Spirit. We receive that Holy Spirit when we, when we become a follower of Christ. Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter said in his uh, famous sermon in Acts chapter 2 that if you repent and you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, essentially if you become a devout follower of Christ, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Peter says that, that this promise is for you, the people he's talking to uh, about 2,000 years ago, and for your children, and for all who are far off. That promise is for you and I today as well. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Now, the Spirit is a difficult word to decipher. There, there are a number of different meanings to the word spirit. Both the Hebrew and Greek word primarily translated as spirit in the Bible, ruach. It's kind of uh, the back of your tongue. Say, say that with me, ruach. Ruach, yeah, well done. Uh, and pneuma or pneuma also uh, means wind or breath. That's the Greek word. At the creation of man, the breath of God or the spirit of God entered Adam and he was given life. God uh, formed Adam from the dust of the ground of the earth, and he whoo, breathed the spirit, uh, breathed the spirit, breathed the, the breath of life into Adam, and Adam was given life. And the exact opposite takes place at death. When we die, our spirit or our breath returns to God. I don't think it's uh, some other dimension or framework of who we are, but it's the breath that gives us life that then returns to God, the, the provider of our breath. So I think there's a lot of confusion on this topic of the, the spirit and, and comparing and contrasting uh, to the soul uh, because spirit can, can mean uh, the breath or the wind or the breeze. But at the same time, in passages like, like what we're about to read, the spirit can refer to our inner being as well. Not, not some other part of who we are, but, but essentially who we are, our, our personhood, our, our personality, our character, that, that is our spirit. And so Paul says that uh, the, the, the wisdom of the world God revealed to us through the spirit, through his spirit. And in this sense, God is revealing this to us through his personal presence for each and every one of us. As we have that promise of the Holy Spirit, God's personal presence dwelling within us. And the Spirit opens our eyes to this reality as the Holy Spirit searches the depths of God. And Paul continues to elaborate on what this process looks like in verse 11. He said, for who knows the person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. 
And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. And so our, our spirit, our personal aspect of life, they, it knows our thoughts better than any other person. My spirit, uh, when we say my spirit is troubled within me, my, my spirit knows my thoughts better than any of you guys know my thoughts. And similarly, the spirit of God knows the thoughts of God better than any other person as well. But the beautiful thing in, in, in that uh, equation there and, and is that you and I, we have access to that spirit. We have access to, to the makings of how God processes, uh, of how he looks at and, and perceives the world. The beautiful thing about when we are reading through scripture, when we are praying to God on a daily basis, when we're continuing to grow closer to him day in and day out and tapping into his spirit, we begin to see more and more things through the perception of God not through our own too limited eyes, through our own limited perspective. And I think that is a tremendous, tremendous power and resource to have at all times, but especially during times of crisis. When you can see the trauma, the difficulty that you are going through, not through your own perspective, but through the perspective of God, you cannot begin to describe the, the, the type of impact that it can have on you and the trauma and the tribulation that you go through because hardship is coming. We all know that. We all have gone through it. Some of us are going through it now. Some of us will be going through it tomorrow or in the next week, the next month, the next year, whatever the case may be. But if you are able to perceive that trauma through God's perspective, it will do you tremendous wonders. And we do that by tapping into God's spirit day in and day out, continuing to grow closer to him. For God's spirit knows his thoughts better than any other person. It's, no one can comprehend the thoughts of God except for the spirit of God. And so closing out uh, th this chapter here, uh, last few verses, verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So Paul says the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him and he's not able to understand them. Kind of summing up everything that Paul has been saying in, in, in this past uh, chapter uh, leading back into uh, the end of chapter one. The wisdom of God is foolish to the wisdom of the world. And so if we do not have access to God's spirit the plans, the workings of God is going to seem foolish to us. But God freely gives us that spirit if we become a devout follower of his son, Christ Jesus. And Paul says, uh, interesting, a phrase there in verse 15, the spiritual person judges all things. They are able to evaluate and understand everything that God's spirit reveals to them. I think there's also an element of Paul talking here about uh, the, this future element of the saints judging the world. Paul states uh, in chapter 6, verse 2, uh, a sneak peek trailer up to what we'll talk about four weeks from now. Uh, but Paul says that the saints will judge the world. I think that is a responsibility and authority that God places on the shoulders of his children, of his saints, is that come this transition from uh, this present evil age to the kingdom age, God has given us that authority and that responsibility to judge the world. Uh, a responsibility authority that's probably not uh, talked about a, a ton. But God, uh, the, the spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord, so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Christ is conceived with the Spirit. Christ was filled with the Spirit. And we too, when we are filled with the Spirit, we have a mind similar to Christ as well, so that we have the mind of Christ.
And so that, that, that is uh, chapter two. From here on out, where uh, chapter two included, we, we're covering these chapters one week at a time. Uh, chapters three, four, five, and six are all fairly short, and we're able to plow through them uh, one uh, week at a time. So four weeks from now, we'll have read through the first six chapters of First Corinthians. But in chapter two, I already gave away three takeaways from chapter two. Kind of uh, an interesting passage here as Paul is talking about preaching, uh, which not many of us here uh, do preaching. Paul is talking about the wisdom from the spirit in contrast to the wisdom of the world. There's three takeaways I think you guys can apply to your life. The first takeaway is that the message of the cross is simple, it is profound, and yet it is hidden from many. We need not overcomplicate who Jesus is and what he accomplished on the cross. It is a simple and profound truth. Yet, many people are hidden from this simple, profound truth. And so that leads us to to take away two. You don't need to be a genius or great with speech to do great work for God. Learning from the works, the accomplishments of Paul, Moses, my grandfather, you don't need to be a master speech, the smartest person in the room to do great work for God. God chooses, uh, we, we took a look at last week, God chooses what is low in the world to accomplish his will. And so this, this gospel message, this message of Jesus, this message of the cross, this message of the resurrection, this message of the kingdom, it's simple, it's profound, even though it's simple, And it's simply hidden for many people. And we have that responsibility to open the eyes, the mind, and the ears, and the hearts of the people around us by sharing the simple but yet powerful and profound message. And then finally, takeaway number three, God's wisdom is a secret that is only revealed by the Holy Spirit. And so as we go and and we tell our friends, our families, our coworkers, our bosses, whoever it may be, and we start sowing the seeds and watering the seeds of a faith in God and a faith in Christ Jesus, and if they take that on for themselves, they'll then be filled with God's spirit, and it's then where they'll be understand God's wisdom, a secret that is hidden from the rest of the world. And so let's invite others into that life altering decision of accepting God's spirit into our lives of that simple, profound, and hidden message. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for the words of your apostle Paul and the tremendous work that he was able to accomplish through you, Father. Father, I thank you for the many ways in which you bless us, the the talents and the abilities that you bless us with. And Father, I ask that you help us use them for your glory and for your honor. Father, I pray that you give us the, the boldness and the courage to share that simple yet profound and yet hidden message with those around us. So Father... We just thank you for this opportunity that we have to preach this word, to read your word, to continue to grow closer to you, to continue tapping in to that powerful resource of your spirit. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.